Okay, so I'm going to, my, my, my talk is based on a paper called Information and the Costs of Privacy that was co-authored with Tom Leonard of the uh, Technology Policy Institute, a think tank in Washington. The title, uh, I'm an economist, and economists often think in terms of trade-offs. The title of the paper indicates the trade-off that we're dealing with here, the trade-off between more use of information and more privacy. Um, so sometimes people talk as if privacy is a free lunch, you can get more of it, uh, but, but what I'm going to focus on is that to get more of it, you have to give up something else, and, and that's, that's the focus of my talk. Um, so the first slide, targeted advertising, useful information. Uh, Bruce Bird talked about this, and he's in the business more than I am. Uh, consumers can learn a lot from advertising. Consumers are better off if they get advertising that's aimed at them. Um, and if it becomes more difficult to communicate, consumers will receive less useful information. Uh, I want, uh, one thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention in the talk is that it's important to focus on more or less, not either or. So people sometimes say, well, Walmart will still communicate with people even if you restrict the way that they can communicate. And that's true, but as you put more restrictions on them, they will communicate less successfully. Um, it's not that they can't communicate, it's not that the internet will disappear or Google will shut down, but uh, the kinds of information, the kinds of services that can be provided become less useful if the information users are more restricted in the way they can use information. So we have to keep in mind always that it's an either, it's a more or less trade-off, not an either or trade-off. Again, um, advertising supports lots of things. We all get lots of free things on the internet, uh, free searches, free email. Uh, we have a list of, I, I think the paper, I'm not sure if the paper was physically given to you or if it's in the cloud, but the, the paper is available. And of course, we have lists of some of the things, many of which you've all used, the free services available on the internet that are provided by, um, by information. But for example, we, people talk about the search engines keeping data for long periods of time. Say, so why do they keep that data? Well, it turns out that that data is very useful. Uh, it's useful if, if Google, for example, wants to try a new algorithm for search. They want to know how that algorithm would have worked had it been in place before. They have a record of, of, of nine, or I think it's now nine months of past searches. They can plug in the new algorithm and see if it gives better or worse results. A simple example, uh, if you're like me, you can't spell, and so when you, when you type something into a Google search box, you misspell it as often as not. Um, and generally speaking, you will get a notice on the top that says, did you mean this, where they actually correct your spelling. Usually, usually they do it right. How do they know what you really meant? Well, they know it because they have this past history of searches and the way people spell things and the way they actually meant to spell them. So there's, uh, so, so the use of this information, again, it, it improves it. Google initially didn't use any private information in their search engines. The search engines were very good, but they're now vastly better, and they're vastly better because this past information is used. Also, what happens with Google over time is people learn to game it, learn to spam, learn to spam sometimes spam Google search results Google can use, and other search engines, can use past results to protect against these kinds of things and to make sure the search engine is as useful as possible. Information has another characteristic uh, that, that, that's important. Information can be reused. It's, it's somewhat of what economists call a public good. So once information is collected for one purpose, it can be used for many other purposes. That's that's why, part of the reason why information is so valuable is because it can be used for many purposes. Um, for example, one way in which information can be used is for security. You've probably all had the experience of trying to, or at least I have, of trying to buy something and they want to be sure it's you and sometimes the merchant will hand you the phone and say, talk to the credit card and the credit card will ask you a couple of questions about yourself to be sure that you are the person using your credit card, a form of security based on the reuse of information, not for the purpose originally obtained, 
but a different use of the information and yet one that can be very valuable. We had a long discussion of the EU. The EU doesn't allow this kind of reuse of information. I think, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak much because I don't know as much as uh, she does, but, but I think they don't allow this kind of, and the result is that actually there is more security breach, more fraud in, the U in, in Europe than in the US because it's more difficult to use information for these kinds of purposes. A very important point, the, the kind of information I'm mostly talking about is advertising information. Um, Mr. Werner talked about, about lots of privacy rules, but the, the, the kind of information I'm concerned with mostly is, is anonymous information. It's advertising, but, but, but it's important to keep in mind that what advertisers want is bodies that may be interested in their product. They don't want um, information about me. I mean, I may come up, as, as, as you said, if, if I happen to look at a website about Lexus, the Lexus dealer down the street may send me an email, but that's not because he's looking at Paul Rubin to see what Paul Rubin's doing. That's because he's buying information about who searched the word Lexus in Atlanta in the last, you know, last, last month. Who are the people that did that? I'm going to focus on them. So the information is anonymous. Uh, the, the, inf the kind of information you were talking about, what did someone do, that kind of, in or, or, or an employer, or health, that kind of information is really not what I'm focusing on. It's a different sort of use of information, very valuable, very important. But what I'm mainly concerned about is the anonymous use of information in advertising. And the important thing there is that the, the, the person doesn't, you don't start with a person and say, what can we sell this person? Uh, the way a merchant would, if you walk in a store, you walk in a store, they say, what can we sell you? But information is used on the internet goes the other way. We have a product, we're looking for webs, not even people, we're looking for computers that have done some kind of search that's relevant for the product we're selling. We're gonna send our information to those computers and we don't care who they are. We don't care what their name is. What we wanna do is get the information available to people that might, might, be, might be interested in buying our product. The way it's sold, the way information is sold is cost per thousand, thousand clicks or thousand views, but not per person, it's per large number of people. So much of the information, the advertising information, is used anonymously, and that's a very, very important point. What are the costs of information? I talked about the benefits, what are the costs? The costs, probably the major cost and, and I've been reading uh, literature, I've been reading things like places like Epic and other places, the, and it's hard to identify the real costs, but the major cost that we have of, of misuse of information is probably identity theft, okay? People are worried about having their identity stolen, they're worried about having their credit cards misused, um, and, and that seems to be the main thing that's driving the demand for privacy. I mean, people talk about other things, but it's hard to get a handle on the other things. It really is hard to figure out what someone loses if someone knows, if, if, if some computer somewhere knows something about him. But I think the main danger is identity theft. So the question is, would reducing the use of information on the internet, of electronic information, would that reduce identity theft? Probably not. Uh, first, of all, first of all, the evidence is that only a fraction of identity theft is based on online information. 11% is the best number I have. And in fact, information is safer, that if it's electronic information is safer than um, physical information. Uh, one of the judges at lunch said, well, they can get your data if they hack the computer. Well, that's probably right, but there's a lot more people who can steal your garbage than there are people who can hack your computer. And if you have if you have information, you throw it away, it's in your garbage and people can, that's a much more likely source of getting it than someone hacking your computer and getting it. In fact, there's some evidence that identity is, 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 is really very, very low value uh, in, in various websites that thieves use to buy and sell information. Um, I think the, the, the last price I, I read some, I, I've never gone to one of those websites not, not having the right codes, but uh, the last price I've seen was that the credit card number sold for 40 cents, which is basically the transactions cost of buying and selling it. Credit card numbers are not scarce. Um, theft is, is limited because there are people with a very strong interest in limiting 
identity theft. As you know, you're only liable for 50 bucks if your card is stolen. Somebody else is liable for the rest of the money and that somebody else has a pretty strong incentive to, to make sure that the identity has not been stolen. The credit card companies have played a major role here in developing security measures and policing security measures. And in fact, the rate of, of, of misuse is probably going down. It's not going up because there are people with a strong interest in this. And in fact, as I said before, more information can reduce risk because it can be used to uh, confirm identity. So the fact that they have information about you can be used with, 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 to confirm that you are who you say you are. Um, one of the fair information principles that was mentioned was the principle that people should have access to their data. That seems like a good principle, except that again, if someone can spoof the, the system and get access to somebody else's data, they can do a much better job of robbing them. So even things that seem obvious initially may have some, some, um, some negative effects. Uh, but most of, our, most of our policy in the US is, is concentrated on keeping it, protecting information, keeping it from being leaked. Um, and that's okay, but, 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 but I think, I think in, in my view, a more useful approach, or at least an equally useful approach, is to go after the real bad guys. The bad guys are the thieves. The bad guys are the fraudsters. The bad guys are those who are stealing the information. Some of them are in Europe, and we can't do it in Eastern Europe, and we can't do much about them. Uh, and other countries, I don't want to smear Eastern Europe, but some of them are here. Some of them, some of them may someday come before your courts, and the longer sentence you can give them, the better. Um, <laughs> the, these people are, are, it's not only the amount they steal that's relevant, but by engaging in fraud, they, they lead the rest of us to take huge, huge and very expensive precautions to avoid fraud. So essentially, they're imposing a very large social cost on all of us. Um, and they, they, should be, they, should, they should bear as much of that social cost as they can. These are the, the people who are actually doing the fraud, not, not someone who makes a mistake and leaks some data. That's a mistake. But the real culprits are, are the, the actual criminals, the actual fraudsters who are, who are doing it. Um, as I said, I've read much of the privacy literature. I talk about some of it in my paper, but you get the feeling from much of this literature that privacy is a free lunch. People talk about, here's all the things we can do to increase privacy, here's all the benefits of privacy, but as an economist, you say, yeah, those things may be benefits, although, as I said, with the identity theft, they may be overrated, but they may be the benefits, but there are real costs, and it's important not only to focus on the benefits, but also on the costs. And People say, well, firms bear those costs. AT&T's costs go up if they impose more restrictions. But those costs aren't borne by firms. Uh, ultimately, if, if, if costs go up, prices go up, ultimately consumers are going to bear those costs. So it's important not to view privacy as a free lunch. When someone says, well, we need more privacy, the relevant question to ask is, what do we give up to get that additional privacy? Uh, what kinds of costs will be imposed if we if we do impose that privacy. Um, one thing you read in the, in, the, in the privacy literature is people say, well, if consumers knew how their data was being used, they would be upset. And you've been, I've been reading that for many years. Really, people don't know how their data is being used. And the reason they don't know is they don't care. Um, people know about that. I misspelled it here. People know about the flu because they see what happens when you get the flu, you're sick, and maybe you die but they don't worry about information because they don't see negative effects. The reason people don't know is because there's nothing to know. There's no harmful effects or very few harmful effects from information misuse. Um, and so again, you know, identity theft is, is, is a problem, but it's not particularly an online problem. Other than that, it's hard to, to some of the things that have been, been proposed, someone mentioned patient privacy. If I've got a disease and a pharmaceutical company sends me an email with a, with a remedy for that disease, hey, you know, it's not, it's not something I want to worry about, it's something I'd be happy to receive. It may, I may want to look into the drug, but um, to say we should restrict the use of that kind of information seems to me to be fairly counterproductive. What should we do? Well, as I say, we should look at costs, policy, we talked about opt-in and opt-out. Um, ultimately, there has to be some default. Uh, if, if we have an opt 
in system which requires people to give consent, the evidence is that people, people tend not to change the default, whatever it might be. So with an opt-in policy, the default is, is don't use the information. Um, and if we have that kind of policy, if, if we have it, sometimes it's useful. Sometimes people sell opt-in lists, for example. They say everybody's agreed to receive emails. But for other purposes, the default might be uh, better to leave it, leave it where it is. Um, but again, it, it's not enough to say we want more privacy. We should focus on um, whatever costs there might be associated with privacy and uh, how we can, how we, and, and whether increasing privacy in some context is worth whatever we have to give up in the way of using information. Great, thank you.